Good afternoon and welcome to the May webinar sponsored by the North American Vascular Biology Organization. I'm Linda Shapiro from the University of Connecticut and a member of the NAVBO Education Committee. I will be moderating today's session. We're pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Joyce Bischoff from the Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And she will present her work entitled Capillary Malformations from Somatic GNAC Mutation to Disrupted Endothelial Function. At this time, I'd also like to welcome Lan Huang, also from Boston Children's and Harvard Medical School. She's going to monitor today's questions. Questions will be handled in two ways. Throughout the presentation, you can type your question into the question box on the control panel. Dr. Wang will compile and then pose the questions to Dr. Bischoff at the end of the presentation. At the end of the question and answer period, provided there is time, attendees will be able to ask any additional questions by clicking the hand icon on the left side of your control panel. You'll be recognized and your mic will be unmuted. You will then be able to ask your question live. Before we get started, I want to go over some logistical aspects. Throughout the webinar, you're able to switch between the phone computer audio and or the phone and the computer audio in case you're having a problem. You can see this information on the audio section of your GoToWebinar control panel. If you experience a few words being skipped in the audio, it might be your Wi-Fi connection. Connecting to the internet through a hardwire should remedy the audio. If you experience technical technical problems, please click the help tab at the top of the control panel. Scroll to the bottom of the help screen for the technical support phone number. This webinar is being recorded and archived on the NAVBO website for future use. Dr. Bischoff's lab studies the role of endothelial cells and parasites in the various settings of vascular disease and in normal repair of vasculature. Her lab focuses on four areas, infantile hemangioma, vascular malformations, endothelial progenitor cells, and heart valve endothelial cells. This webinar will be a more in-depth version of what she presented at the session at Vascular Biology in 2018 entitled Blood Vessel Morphogenesis and Vascular Malformations. Welcome, Dr. Bischoff. Okay, um, thank you, Linda, and um, thank you to, to you and the NAVBO Education Committee for inviting me to present our work this afternoon. It's really uh, an honor. Um, so you see, I'll get started right away with um, moving the slides for, oh, actually, okay. Um, so this is a title slide kind of repetitious, so I'm gonna skip this, but, um, and just get right into first the outline of the presentation. I first I wanna introduce to all of you capillary malformations and their association with a rare disease called Sturge-Weber syndrome. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about work that Land's done to identify the cells within the capillary malformations that contain the GNAQ mutation. Um, we'll present some work about signaling downstream from the mutant G alpha Q. And then also at the end, describe some new findings um, on perivascular macrophage like cells in, in surrounding the capillary malformation vessels. So, on the next slide, um, just a quick overview to touch on some of the major projects or, or, or current projects in the lab, too. Um, as Linda mentioned, we've worked for a long time on infantile hemangioma. We're also working on a rare hemangioendothelioma, which is kind of a, uh, an extreme version of, of infantile hemangioma. And these are really, I think the theme here is a loss of vascular quiescence. So we're very interested in the mechanisms that you know, are out of control here that are, are, are lacking and, and you get these uh, excessive vessel formation. And then the third picture in panel C is a, is a man with a capillary malformation. These are often called port wine stains. And, and you'll note that it, it's sort of a hemifacial uh, distribution and that's gonna come up uh, in a, again and again through the talk. So these are three, these are examples of vascular tumors, the first A and B, and then a vascular malformation. They look similar in a lot of ways, but they're really quite different. So as I mentioned, um, this actually this, the, in panel C, the, this uh, gentleman has what's called Sturge-Weber syndrome. And so on the next slide, I wanna tell you a little bit about Sturge-Weber syndrome, because it's quite rare and perhaps not everyone's heard about it, but it's a rare congenital neurocutaneous disorder. It, the estimate is anywhere from one in 20,000 to one in 50,000 uh, uh, babies will be born with Sturge-Weber syndrome. It's sporadic, it's not inherited, uh, so that's important. 
and it's associated with capillary malformations in three locations. And I should say throughout the talk, I'll be uh, abbreviating capillary malformation CM. Excuse me, I'm having a little trouble with my mouse. Um, so the first location is in the dermis. And as you saw in the previous slide, um, these are called port wine stains. And they, you know, they start off not too bad when the, a baby's born, but they can really darken and thicken over time. And actually, there's associated with soft tissue and skeletal overgrowth. Um, and then in the, 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 sorry, excuse me, went ahead. They're also um, it's, uh, present in the leptomeninges of the brain. Um, and there, these capillary malformations are associated with seizures, strokes, neurodevelopmental delays, and, and atrophy. And this is really, really the really devastating part of Sturge Weber syndrome. And then, well, the third part is that, that the capillary malformations are also found in the choroid of the eye, and they cause glaucoma and retinal hemorrhaging. So Sturge Weber syndrome, it's, it's really, you know, it's, a, it's rare, but it's quite devastating. And there's no medical therapy, no medical therapies or cures. It really, it's just managed. The port wine stains um, can be treated sometimes or minimized with laser therapy. Um, the neurologist will try to prevent the strokes um, and seizures with medications. Um, and, and for the uh, glaucoma, it's, there's really no treatment. So um, anyway, so that's Sturge-Weber syndrome. And there's um, a, another feature, another interesting aspect of Sturge-Weber syndrome is that the location of the port wine stain uh, is really indicative of a Sturge-Weber syndrome. So port wine stains are pretty common. They're in one in 3,000 newborns. And you've probably seen people with port, with port wine stains, this reddish patch on the skin. Um, but if the port wine stain is present in this, as I mentioned, hemifacial uh, location uh, on one half of the face, or even just on the upper half of the face, including the, the uh, eyelid and forehead, or in the midline, then, the, then the, the child has a very high risk of Sturge Weber syndrome. It goes up to like one in four or one in two. Um, so the, if, a, if a baby has this distribution of, of port wine stain, they're immediately, they have to be followed by neurologists and ophthalmologists. And I should say, this is a very nice review article by Zalman et al. that, that talks about this, all, all kinds of clinical features and, and questions for Sturge-Weber syndrome. And they note in their article that, this, um, that the port wine stain is really associated with the embryonic vasculature of the face. Um, really rather than the trigeminal nerve, which is, was thought to be a clue for many years. So on the next slide, I want to dive into the, or go into more depth about these capillary malformations in Sturge-Weber syndrome. So they're in, the first feature is that they're enlarged vessels. And you can see examples of that in the, in the, the H&E section shown below. There's, um, uh, excuse me, okay. It, you can see um, this is a skin specimen, so a port wine stain. We have a huge vessel here uh, with really kind of chaotic perivascular cells. Here's a capillary malformation in the leptomeninges of the brain. They're, they're actually in the sulcus, which are these invaginations into the, in, 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 into the brain. And then here you see in the choroid, just numerous uh, blood-filled vessels. And so another feature is this disorganized perivascular cells, which I, you can see here, but then also by immunostaining. Here, um, Lan labeled the, a section for endothelial cells in green and, and mural or perivascular cells in red. I think this is calponin staining. And you can see very uneven coverage, like very thick, um, thick layers in some areas and, and no or few perivascular cells in others. And then another a final feature is stasis. So there's really, these are slow flow lesions. And there's really, um, you know, in the brain, this lack of blood flow is, is a problem because it can create hypoxia and then neurovascular uh, defects in neurovascular coupling. So this, the enlarged vessels, I want to point out that there was a paper published fairly recently in British Journal of Dermatology where Tanadol actually measured the circumference of the blood vessels in control skin vessels versus port wine stain uh, sections. And you can see this enlargement. The, all, the vessels, the smaller vessels are, are shifted to the, to the right to a larger size. And then there's also this um, very large vessels, enlarged vessels out here that are unique to the port wine, 
Port Wine Stains. So this is going to come up again uh, later. So in, in 2013, there was a landmark paper in the New England Journal of Medicine published by Ann Comey and Jonathan Pevsner at Johns Hopkins University. And what they found is that Sturge Weber syndrome and port wine stains are caused by a somatic mutation in GNAQ. So GNAQ encodes the heterotrimeric G protein subunit G alpha Q. So many of you will be familiar with this from your G protein uh, uh, studies. And um, the R183Q mutation is found in basically 90% of port wine stains and 90% of brain specimens from patients with Sturge Weber syndrome. So it's it's really fascinating that it's always the same amino acid and basically the same change in you know in 90%. So there's 10%. I don't know Jonathan Petzner and his his colleagues are looking very hard to find what the other 10% are, but um, it's really quite striking how consistent this mutation is. In other types of vascular malformations like venous malformations um, or uh, AVMs, there's many different types of mutations can can cause them. For venous malformations, there's mutations in TIE2, but there's a number of different mutations, like a whole 10, 12 different mutations. And they also can be caused by mutations in PIK3CA. So here in Sturge Weber syndrome, it's, I think it's quite interesting how consistent it is. And this mutation is predicted to increase the activity of G alpha Q. So it's a somatic activating mutation. So and this, I should say, this work, sorry, going back, has been confirmed by many groups. At least three or four papers have been published from different laboratories. So this is a, a solid finding, I would say. And it's actually, it's been confirmed by our group where we're collaborating with Aaron Green, who's a plastic surgeon here at Children's. So he, we can, he's able to, he, um, from his surgery, uh, he often is doing surgery on patients with, with very devastating port wine stains to alleviate some of the disfigurement. And so we were able to look at uh, capillary malformations from port wine stains, and we were also able to get um, brain specimens from Sturge Weber patients who have to undergo neurosurgery. And you can see that, uh, that we're uh, measuring the mutant allelic frequency by droplet digital PCR, and you see it's, it's low. It's in the you know, 2 to maybe 11 percent range. And again, we find the same GNAQ mutation, although occasionally there's a patient that has a slightly different mutation. So it's R183 to glycine, or down here, R183 to leucine. So there, there's always exceptions. And actually, these are port wine stains on the leg. And here we found um, the mutation is in GNA11, which is a very homologous alpha subunit. It has a very, it's um, very similar to G-alpha-Q. It's 90% um, identical at the amino acid sequence level. Uh, but again, the mutation is at the same position at arginine 183. So um, that's interesting to us. And I just want to give you a little bit of uh, information about the structure of G alpha Q. So here, this is a schematic just depicting it. It's 359 uh, amino acids long. And this schematic shows some of the major um, structural regions. So at the amino terminus, there's the phospholipase beta 3 binding domain which is uh, one of its first its major downstream effectors. And you all know that phospholipase beta-3 clips PIP2 into, excuse me, sorry, IP3 and diacylglycerol. Um, and then at the C-terminal end is the G-protein coupled receptor binding domain. And then in the middle here is the beta-gamma dimer binding domain. Um, and here, this is where the R183 mutation lies. Um, it, shown here in red, it's in the switch region one. And there's actually another mutation that's quite famous in uveal melanoma. It's called Q209L. And it, it's a mutation here is found in 40 to 50 percent of uveal melanomas. And it's they're thought these two are thought to be similar, but um, actually some recent work, uh, computational modeling studies from um, Martins at, Martin and et al. showed that um, most likely these have fairly different effects on. Uh, they're both activating, but they have different mechanisms for activating the G alpha Q. But anyway, so the R183Q mutation is thought to, um, the loss of the arginine at this position is predicted to reduce hydrogen bonding with GDP, and then that, thereby favoring the active GDP, GD, sorry, GTP bound G alpha Q. So that's just some 
biochemistry for all of you. Um, so the first question we asked is after the you know, mutation was reported is, well, which cells in the capillary malformation contain the GNAQ mutation? And you know, the endothelial cells are a good bet, could be pericytes, it could be some other um, accessory cells. So what Lan Wang shown here in her picture here, which Lan is a, an instructor in the lab, and what Lan did was devise a very nice uh, fax sorting protocol where she was sorting out specific cell populations from Sturge Weber um, patient specimens. So we were able to get, as I mentioned, from our collaborators, Aaron Green and um, Anna Pinto in, in neurology, either skin or brain capillary malformation tissue. And she digests it very gently but thoroughly to get a single cell suspension and then labels with actually a, a little a three anti-endothelial markers, VE cadherin, CD31, and VEGFR2 to pull out the endothelial cells. And at the same time, she's labeling with anti-PDGF receptor beta to pull out the pericytes and then also anti-CD45, anti-glycophorin A to pull out hematopoietic cells. And she sorts the cells by fax and then, and then performs the droplet digital PCR to figure out uh, the mutant allelic frequency. And some of, the, some of the data shown here, this is on two different Sturge Weber brain specimens. And what you can see is that the mutant allelic frequency in the total cell um, digest, so the total single cell suspension is in the six to eight percent range and then but then the endothelial fraction is really enriched in the mutation now we're at 35 percent and 24 percent so there's an enrichment and that, that was exciting to us the the hematopoietic cells are really negative for the mutation the pdgf receptor beta positive cells we didn't get very many so it's hard to actually be sure about those but in other Actually, in other experiments, we know there's very little mutation in that fraction. And then um, the triple negative cells. So these are cells that didn't bind any of those antibodies. And there's, there's still a, a good, uh, there's a high mutant allele, allelic frequency there. And so we don't know the, the identity of the mutant cells in this fraction, but we're, of course, working on that very hard. And um, that'll be important to know. But for the moment, um, or at present, we're really focused on the endothelial cells. And, and, um, as, um, and we, we know that the, the endothelial cells have higher mutant allelic frequency from both skin and brain um, Sturge Weber specimens. So this is, um, and then Land's able to grow the mutant cells and culture. Here's the primary culture of, um, from a brain specimen, and you can see that some endothelial-like cells growing out. And then she does a CD31 um, selection of this primary culture. And you can see that the CD31 positive cells are 100% positive and the CD31 negative cells are negative, which is good. And here's data from, now we have a third brain specimen. Um, again, we have the mutant allelic frequency in the starting population. But now as the cells have been expanded as CD31 positive or CD31 negative um, at, up at passage four, we still see um, a higher mutant allelic frequency in these cells. And I just want to take a minute to, probably most of you know this, but there are obviously two alleles of GNAQ per cell. So if 100% mutant population would have a mutant allelic frequency of 50%, so we don't have 50% here, we've got 15%, 21 and 32%. And so this is one allele per cell. So you double it to get the percent mutant cells. So we, this population is basically 30% mutant cells, 42% mutant cells and 64% mutant cells. So when we um, isolate the brain endothelial cells, it's a mixture of mutant and non-mutant cells, which is um, you know, highly relevant, that's what what's going on in the lesions in vivo, but we have to keep that in mind as we do experiments um, in vitro. So the next, um, I just wanna tell you a little bit about the downstream signaling from G-alpha-Q. Obviously it's coupled to a G-protein coupled receptor and in its inactive state, it's bound to beta gamma. This would be a G GDP bound. Um, it's not shown here, but in the mutation causes a constitutive activation of G alpha Q, which means it's separate from its beta gamma uh, dimer pair. And these individual um, subunits then go on to do their own signaling. And G alpha Q activates phospholipase beta three, 
and downstream there, then we'll, you have diacetylglycerol and, and, and IP3, which can lead to ERK signaling and calcium signaling. And then the beta gamma subunits can activate PI3 kinase. So there's a lot going on here. And our first um, question is, is like, well, what's happening with phospholipase beta-3? Is it really, if this, obviously it should be active if, if, if there's constitutive, if the mutation is causing constitutive activation of, of G alpha Q. So the first way we did that, before we get into the in vitro studies, I want to show you, we looked at this in the, in, in, in the Sturge Weber uh, specimens to see what the vessels look like. And here, um, what Land did, this is very recent data, she double stained with an endothelial marker, which we use Ulex Europa Seglutinin 1 um, frequently. It's a great marker for human endothelial cells. And then she also stained for phospholipase beta-3 phosphorylated at serine 537. And this is an active, this is how it gets activated. And what you can see in normal skin, we see lots of green vessels. And if you look carefully, very faintly, these vessels are just barely positive for the active phospholipase beta-3. And here's the merged image. You can see some of these are a little bit yellow. But when we look in the capillary malformation in the skin, you see uh, lots of green vessels, and some of them are strongly positive um, for phospholipase beta-3 phosphorylated at 537. And the merge image here, again, you can see the, the um, strongly positive vessels. So this is exciting to us. I mean, we would then predict that these are cells, these vessels are composed of mutant endothelial cells, and perhaps uh, some of the other ones are, are less, less so. So um, actually, before we also looked at, Lan also looked at phospho erk staining because that's one of the is downstream of the um, uh, PL, PLC uh, beta three, and she got very beautiful staining here in Sturge Weber brain. You can see um, some now the phospho erk is in green. You see some strongly positive vessels, uh, also um, and some weakly positive vessels. In the skin, we're seeing uh, also double positive vessels. And hemangioma is our positive control. You can see ERK staining in this vessel here. In normal skin, it's, a, you know, it's, it's also there. So when Land counted up phospho ERK positive vessels per millimeter squared across many sections and many and three different uh, biological replicates for brain, capillary malformation of the skin and hemangioma and then normal skin, there really wasn't a big difference um, in the phospho erk staining. So we, in, in terms of number of vessels that are positive for phospho erk, it doesn't look to be really that different from what you see in, in normal skin or in hemangioma. But we still have a lot more work to do on that in terms of figuring out the number of positive cells, positive endothelial cells. And the next question uh, Lan asked was, what about proliferating cells? Are these lesions proliferative? I mean, they're actually, there's expanded vasculature. So, and what you can see is that there are some KI67 positive cells in the, in these, uh, the vessels now are stained red for Ulex Europus agglutinin. And you see in the brain, and you see some in the skin, capillary mal, oh, sorry, ah, malformation. And, and here's, again, hemangioma is our positive control where there's a lot of KI67 positive cells in hemangioma, and that's well known. So again, by quantifying the KI67 positive vessels per millimeter squared across many samples, now um, these actually look pretty quiescent compared when you compare it to hemangioma. So these are just some, um, some features of, of the Sturge Weber uh, capillary malformation vessels that we've, that we've been able to sort out. So to summarize the, um, what I've told you so far, first from the literature, we know that the GNAQ R183Q mutation is found in basically 90% of Sturge Weber brain and uh, Sturge Weber and non-syndromic uh, capillary malformation. So these would be port wine stains that are not associated with where the patient does not have Sturge Weber syndrome. And then um, the, R, the mutation is enriched in endothelial cells from both brain and skin CMs. And um, so these first two points in black are, are published studies. Um, and, and we published Lance, the co-first author on, on the two studies here. Um, and then in gray are, are our newer findings, not published yet, that 
there's active phospholipase beta-3 endothelial cells in the stirred rubber brain vessels that we can see by immunostaining, and that the stir stirred rubber vessels do not show an increased number, or, or sorry, this should be stirred rubber sections don't show an increased number of phospho or, or KI67 positive vessels. So they, they're, not, they're not really proliferative lesions. So now, I, now we'll turn to some of our um, in vitro studies and looking at what's happening downstream of the R183Q mutation. And we have three cellular models we've developed or are developing. And the first is, as you, you saw data for this, the CM-derived endothelial cells. So we can isolate endothelial cells from skin or brain capillary malformations. And, and remember, these are a mixture of mutant and non-mutant cells. And to date, we really don't have a way to separate the mutant from the um, non-mutant. We haven't found any markers that just, you know, distinguish them, um, even from RNA-seq data. Uh, but that's what we have. And then the, the other uh, second model is to use lentiviral uh, transduction methods to express either the wild type GNAQ or mutant GNAQ in normal human endothelial cells. And we've done this now in endothelial colony forming cells. These are very robust proliferative cells from cord blood and also in QVEX, human umbilical vein endothelial cells. I think everyone's familiar with those. And then we've also expressed both in human brain endothelial cells that are commercially available. And then the third um, model that we're trying to, which is ongoing, is, is to use CRISPR-Cas9 editing to introduce the mutation into one allele. And Colette Bixell in the lab, she's, she's done that successfully in ECFCs. Um, we're still working on optimizing the method and, and because um, you know the cells, we, we can get the editing done, but then they're pretty pooped out by the time we have them in hand. Um, so that's ongoing. I think it's going to be feasible. So what uh, this just summarizes how LAN has done the lentiviral um, transduction. So we have a vector uh, with the, where we insert either wild type or the mutant GNAQ. There's, each, there's GFP there, so we can uh, the cells are transduced and then sorted for GFP positive cells. And um, again, she's done this with three different recipient endothelial cells. And then she measures the mutant allelic frequency. So now there are two normal alleles in, in the starting normal endothelial cells, and we're putting in a third by lentivirus. So what we expect is that the mutant allele frequency would be 30, 33%, and, and she's getting 32%, which is very close. So it's 0, 0, and then 32%. So that's good. And then the, this um, shows a Western blot for G alpha, G alpha Q, and you can see that in our wild type and R183Q mutant cells, we, we're overexpressing. So you were getting an increase in G alpha Q. And, and you can see that here by Western blot. So that's also something to keep in mind. And so the first question is we asked is, is phospholipase beta-3 constitutively active in, in the mutant cells, endothelial cells? And we want to look at uh, growth. We, we starve the cells overnight in 2% relatively low FBS and no growth factors in, in endothelial basal media. And so this is our um, condition for all the experiments I'll be showing you. This, and so now that these are in a quiescent, fairly quiescent state. And we then look at um, expression of the phospholipase beta-3 that's phosphorylated at 537. And you can see there's a big increase in um, this activated phosphoserine in the mutant endothelial cells. And there's a, a second phosphorylation site called uh, at a serine 1105. Excuse me, one sec. That's um, this is an inhibitory phosphoserine site, and it's barely phosphorylated, and there's certainly no difference between um, the wild type and the mutant. And then we have total phospholipase beta three here, and total phospholipase beta one, just for just for fun. Um, so Lan did several Western blots and, and quantified these, and, you, and we, what she could see is that there is a statistically significant increase in the active in phospholipase beta three with the active activating phosphoserine uh, phosphorylated, and, and no change in the inhibitory one. So this um, is is uh, good uh, to see that. One thing that we also looked at proliferation of these mutant endothelial cells, and so the you know it's the allele is there, the mutant allele is there, 
phospholipase beta-3 is activated, so everything's working. But what we noticed, and I think others have as well, is that the mutation slows down proliferation. And you can see that here. Sorry, I'm trying to find, find the pointer. Um, you can see that here. When we just do a regular VEGFA-stimulated proliferation assay over four days, the brain endothelial cells are growing just nicely. But the Sturge-Weber brain endothelial cells, again, these are a mix of mutant and non-mutant, they're growing much more slowly. And then we see the same thing when we introduce the mutation. So either the wild-type cDNA, wild-type gene AQ, or the mutant. And this just slows down the proliferation of these very fast, these are very robust cells. And again, they're just, so something about the mut mutation really um, dampens down proliferation, and that is consistent with what we saw um, in vivo, too. So we looked at, um, we wanted to, we asked, Erlan did these experiments. She asked, well, is there constitutive, is there anything uh, going on with VEGFR2 or phospho-ERK, which is downstream of VEGFR2? And what we can see here is that there's really no constitutive activation of VEGFR2 or phospho-ERK in, in this, in, um, in the presence of, uh, in the Sturge-Weber brain endothelial cells. So these cells, again, they're serum starved or overnight for 16 hours, no growth factors, and then treated with VEGFA for um, you know, 5, 10, 15, 30, 60, 120 minutes. So what you can see in the basal state, so this, the serum starved state, is that there's no, in both cases, let's focus over here, there's no VEGFR2 phosphorylation. Um, there's VEGFR2 is there, there's really no Phospho-ERK, um, phospho-ERK is present, and no phosphorylated P38. When you treat with VEGF, we're, the receptor is getting phosphorylated just fine, very robustly, and it's transient as, as expected. And phospho-ERK is going up transiently, and phospho-P38. So everything, in fact, these are, the receptor is working um, perfectly OK in these mutant cells. So that's uh, something we learned. and. So now we um, just we we land, we've done a lot of experiments looking at phospho ERK and actually phospho AKT too. So so some major downstream pathways that should be activated by this mutation, and phospholipase beta three, as I showed you, is clearly activated, but we're only seeing mo I mean at best modest ERK ERK activation it, when you summarize or, or quantify you know three or four Western blots. It's just there's not a significant increase in phospho-ERK, and there's really no increase in AKT either. So that leaves the calcium signaling pathway. And that is something we're actively looking at at NFETC1, and it's down some of its downstream targets. And um, so we're um, focused, and I'm making a point of this because they're, they're really in the field, there's a lot of expectation that, a, that ERK, the ERK pathway will be altered. And that a lot of that is based on the uveal melanoma um, studies where this other, nearby mutation Q209L, where there it's, it is clear that the ERK, is, ERK pathway is activated. But um, at least in vitro, we're not really seeing much ERK activation, if any, and, and no phospho-AKT. So um, the next um, question that we asked is, can, these, um, can the mutant endothelial cells form capillary malformation-like vessels in vivo? And so to do that, we used an in vivo model that we've used for many years to study neovascularization with human cells. And this is a schematic um, showing that procedure where we take our favorite endothelial colony forming cells. These are human endothelial cells. We actually combine them with a mesenchymal progenitor cell that we isolate either usually from bone marrow. They're combined in an extracellular matrix, most of the time matrigel, which is liquid at four degrees. So then you can just if you keep everything cold, you can inject subcutaneously into mice, and, and you have an implant, a matrigel cell implant, actually depicted here. It's uh, single cells. When they first are implanted, it's really, sorry, okay, it's a mix of single, of both cell types in the matrigel. But then within, um, we know this from a lot of work we've done, the cells, the, the endothelial cells and mesenchymal progenitor cells start forming nascent vessels, and then eventually they hook up with the mouse vessels that are coming in, and you get perfused vessels. And this works really well with 
normal human endothelial cells and mesenchymal progenitor cells. And, and here you see a typical vascularized implant. And this just a, this was work that really was pioneered in my lab many years ago by Juan Malero Martin, who's um, a NAPO member, and I think many of you know him. But anyways, if you uh, here we can see the perfused vessels. They have red blood cells inside. Um, they all stain with human uh, anti-human CD31. And to quantify our count, uh, microvascularization in this model, what we do is count vessels with red blood cells. So meaning, so we're counting perfused vessels, um, as you can see here. And and this just also just shows that you need both cell types to get this robust vascularization. If we implant endothelial cells alone or mesenchymal progenitor cells alone, we don't, we see, we basically don't get any vascularization. So we, uh, LAN used this model to ask whether the mutant cells could form vessels, and they do. And that's shown here, we have our wild, actually this is really a uh, great experiment. We got very strong vascularization with both the wild type and the mutant endothelial cells. So these look pretty similar, but when you, look at sections and stained by H&E, you can see here we've got lots of red blood cell filled vessels as um, similar to our you know, previous work, but these mutant cells are forming really enlarged vessels. Oh, sorry, hold on. You know, they're greatly enlarged vessels. So now if you count them, just one vessel is a lumen with red blood cells. Actually, the vessel density is lower for the mutation the mutant cells compared to the wild type. But clearly there's something going on here. And Lynn also quantified human vessels in these implants because there are some mouse vessels that are coming in. That's how you get, you get perfusion. But the human vessel density is also decreased. <clears throat> but then she went ahead and she measured in both the wild type and uh, mutant implants, the vessel, si vessel area by size and, and, and uh, segregated them by size. So as shown here along the, the x-axis. And what you, so then, and for both populate, for both um, types of cells, and what she found is that there's a reduced number of small vessels. So you can, these are lower compared to here. And there's an increased number of enlarged vessels, especially these really big ones way out here. We go from just like 1% 1 up to five or 6%. And the, P, the, star, the arrows show this um, statistically significant changes. And this is nice because if you remember, I showed you earlier in the, in the webinar that there's published studies on the vessel, this is circumference of, control, of normal skin vessels versus port wine stain. And there's this of a, kind of a similar pattern. There's this, you know, an increase or a presence of very enlarged vessels and also a shift towards um, bigger vessel, I mean, a reduction in, in small vessels compared to the control. So we're excited about this because it shows that the mutant vessels are at least recapitulating some features of uh, capillary malformations in patients. So um, the next, the last um, topic I'm going to cover is we, of course, wonder about the perivascular cells that are surrounding the, the Sturge Weber brain vessels and, cap and skin uh, Port Weinstein vessels, and this is work that uh, is uh, preliminary in a preliminary stage, but is being led by Colette Bixell, who's a, a postdoc in the lab. And here's just one of her very beautiful confocal images, where she's here. We have the brain uh, vessels are labeled with Ulex Europus agglutinin UEA1, and you see the endothelium. Actually, we see all these abnormalities, which have, are uh, of like piling up of endothelial cells and even this endothelial bridge. Um, and Ka67 is very low, it's like one positive cell there. Um, for a number of reasons, she also stained with LIV1. We want to get, get a look at if, uh, if there was a lymphatic component. And there are LIV1 positive cells, but they're not lymphatic vessels. These are single cells and they're just around the vessels. Um, so they're you can see them by the green arrows. I hope they're clear to everyone. So this was interesting. Uh, live one can be expressed by macrophages. So, you know, that's a possibility. So she went ahead and did some more staining with an, a, a marker called MRC1, which is the mannose receptor um, on macrophages. 
and Live One and CD68, which is a pan uh, macrophage marker. And what you, so these are the three colors all together. You get sort of a yellowish white. And you can see lots and lots of triple positive cells here in the Sturge Weber brain specimen, but not in, the, in this one, in this control brain specimen. And when she, uh, Colette quantified this, you can see that there's a big increase compared to control in MRC1 positive, Live 1 positive, and CD68 positive cells. So she went on and stained with a second uh, or another marker called Prox1, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And Prox1 is really known as a master regulator of lymphatic endothelial cell specification. And, and, and um, it turns out, so again, we, she's triple labeled, Colette triple label for MRC1, pod, MRC1, Live1, and Prox1. And you see all these yellow, white positive cells. And if you, here is each channel uh, shown individually, and you can clearly see there's very strong co-localization. So there are these macrophage-like cells that are expressing PROX1. This is really interesting to us. And if you look really carefully, you, I hope you can see that the PROX1 is actually in the cytoplasm, not in the nucleus, which maybe makes sense because these are not lymphatic vessels. And, and if PROX1 was in the nucleus, you'd probably be getting lymphatic vessel formation. So with um, Stephen Danico is a Harvard undergraduate who did a research independent study in the lab and worked with Colette. And he actually did a lot of um, confocal analysis and quantification of these cells. And, and what, what you can see is that when you count up of the, the MRC1 positive cells, they're basically 100% are MRC1 positive, Live1 positive, and CD68 positive, and so on. Live1 positive cells are basically 100% are expressing all three markers and CD68 positive cells. And then the PROX1 analysis is, is, is very similar. The cells, very close to 100% of the cells are expressing all three markers. So what are these cells? Um, uh, this, oh, this is just showing that Colette was also found these um, triple positive cells in, uh, or the MR, this shows live one and MRC1 positive cells in, <coughs> in the Sturge Weber um, skin capillary malformation, so the Port Weinstein specimens. And actually she looked at a couple other features of, of these cells, trying to figure out uh, a little bit more about them. And the, they're, they're not positive for CD15, which is a neutrophil marker. So you can see that here, there are neutrophils that are red, There's, that's the anti-CD15, um, and they're not expressing MRC1 or or ULEC, so that's that's good. So they're distinct from that population. There's very, you know, there's a couple of proliferating cells you can see, and they, um, some of the live one positive cells are are expressing Ki67, so some proliferative capacity. And then also the endothelium, she double labeled, she's staying for ICAM1, which is a leukocyte adhesion molecule that's, um, and the cells are very strongly positive for ICAM1. So um, we, of course, we're considering are these, why are they ICAM1 positive? Is it an endogenous or an inherent feature of the, of the Sturge Weber vessels? Or is it, are there, is it because of exposure to inflammatory cytokines from, else, from other um, neighboring cells? So back to, so what are these MRC1, Live1, Prox1 positive cells? Well, it turns out, just to set things in, in context, there was a, uh, a bunch of paper, well, three papers, I'm highlighting two here, in 2017 about this novel perivascular cell population in the zebrafish brain. And one paper was from Brant Weinstein's lab and the other from Ben Hogan's lab. And there was a third from Stefan Schulte-Merker in, in the Netherlands. And they're, they have different names for the cells. So I'm going to um, focus on, on Brant Weinstein's nomenclature. But, and, and, and this is a schematic from his paper. So these are called fluorescent granular parathelial cells, and they reside in the leptomeninges in close association with blood vessels. And they are MRC1 positive, Live1 positive, and Prox1 positive. So this is very similar, if not identical, to what, or very similar to what Colette found in the Sturge Weber brain. I mean, her, I just showed you the cell, that there are these triple positive cells there that are, um, in close association with the blood vessels. And another uh, work in, in this presented in the paper um, from Brant Weinstein's lab showed that 
these FGPs um, actually originate in the choroid, uh, in the primitive endothelial cells originate in the choroid of the eye of the zebrafish brain. And, um, and they migrate out to the leptomeninges and, and take up residence here. And they're, it, they're phagocytic, and, but you know, it's really, they're just an extremely interesting cell type, like exactly what it's doing and why it has this sort of lymphatic um, molecular signature, but sort of a phagocytic uh, macrophage-like phenotype. So we're uh, keeping an eye on this and, and really curious is to the nature of this of these cells in the stirred rubber brain and if they're how closely they're connected to the mutation. So um, to summarize what I've talked about today is that um, these mutant endothelial cells in Sturge Weber syndrome, the, the mutation is enriched in endothelial cells isolated from skin and brain capillary malformations. And we also found uh, that it, the mutations present in the choroid of the capillary malformations in, in one patient with uh, really bad glaucoma where the eye had to be um, enucleated. And that was published, um, we published that the, early this year by Colette Pixel. Um, the mutant endothelial cells proliferate slowly, even when they're stimulated with VEGFA. And this match, this is consistent with the proliferation in vivo, which is also low um, and we, when compared to infantile hemangioma. As a positive control, um, the mutant endothelial cells show constitutive activation of phospholipase C beta three, which is you know the first uh, downstream mediator of the active GAlpha Q. The mutant endothelial cells form enlarged vessels when we put them into nude mice, so that uh, is encouraging that we're getting a, a relevant uh, in vivo model. And then the final is that we found these MRC1 positive, CD68 positive, Live1 positive, Prox1 positive perivascular cells are very abundant in the Sturge Weber brain. And, and so the, you know, what these cells are doing in terms of um, contributing to the capillary malformation or contributing to the disease is something we're, of course, actively thinking about and, and trying to uh, understand. And then the final slide is an acknowledgement slide. Here's a picture of my lab. Here's Lan Wang, who's did a, whose work I presented, and Colette Bixell, whose, whose work I also work, presented her work. Other lab members are listed here. Um, we have a lot of collaborators for this project. I mentioned, especially in the beginning, Aaron Green. He's a plastic surgeon at Boston Children's Hospital, taking care of patients with all kinds of, you know, really kind of disfiguring vascular lesions. So we're able to get specimens from Aaron. A lot of some of the droplet digital PCR, getting that up and running, we did with Matt Warman. He's a geneticist at Children's. Harry Kazakiewicz and Sandra Alex Alexandrescu are both pathologists at Children's. And Sandra in particular is a, is a neuropathologist. So she's been extremely helpful with uh, looking at the brain uh, sections and also getting us tissue uh, brain specimens. Anna Pinto is the neurologist at Children's who takes care of uh, the babies with Sturge Weber syndrome and and really uh, well she, she sometimes when they're going to go for neurosurgery and then we're able to get a brain specimen she she helps to coordinate all that and also M Mustafa Sahin is also co-director of the of the um, Sturge Weber clinic and Joe Madsen is the neurosurgeon so this is really a valuable um, collaboration because we're able to do things that really would not be possible in a lot of other places. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our current funding. We're able, we have translate, we have some pilot funding from the Translational Neuroscience Center at Boston Children's, and I didn't have a chance to touch on that project, but we're looking at the mutant endothelial cells and how they're interacting with um, actually IPS derived neuronal cultures. Um, we've been able to get funding from the Sturge Weber Foundation. Currently, Colette has a small project grant from them, but the Sturge Weber Foundation has been very, uh, we've been very fortunate. Both Lan and Colette were, got one year, were one year Lisa's Fellowship Awards from the Sturge Weber Foundation. And um, so with that, I'll end and I'm um, happy to take any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Bischoff. I see we have several questions from the audience and I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Huang so she can direct these questions to Dr. Bischoff. Okay, thanks. Hello, um, Joyce, there's a few yeah. questions for you. 
So the first question from Tim the Grass, he is uh, asking, um, why do you think the allele frequency of the GNAQ mutation is so low in both CM and Sturgeon web brain lesions? Is there a correlation of the allele frequency with this disease severity? Um, well, that's a that's a fantastic question, Tim. Thank you very much. And um, there is, uh, you know, the the mutant allele frequency is low just because it's a mosaic. It's it yeah, that's it, it's, um, it's not a like a hundred percent of the cells are mutant. But here we have one figure. I anticipated this question where these are patients of uh, Dr. Aaron Greens. You can see they all have uh, varying um, uh, degrees of capillary malformation on the face and we do know the mutant allele frequency for specimens from all of these patients. And, and there is a sort of a correlation between uh, the mutant allele frequency and the severity. You know, this woman out here obviously has a terrible one. Um, so there is, you know, the, it is thought that the, the, there is a correlation between the size of the Port Weinstein and, and, um, and the mutant allele frequency and also severity of, of actually Sturge Weber syndrome. So, okay, that, I hope that's... All right, thanks. So yeah. the second question from Mike Dellinger, he uh -huh. asking, uh, MRC1, CD68, LIFE1, and Proxy1 positive cells only observed in um, Sturgeon brain or they also observed in um, skin CM? Oh, so I show, I went over that quickly, but yes, we see them in, in um, the skin capillary malformation specimens. Um, we certainly wanna, you know, we've done a few of each of those. We certainly need to do more. Um, and another question we'd like to address there, um, which is um, in capillary mouth, you know, there are port wine stains that um, on the, we have some that are on the leg that have a GNA11 mutation. So a different mutation we wanna see if, you know, we can, see if they're there or not in those specimens as well. Um, but yeah, we see them in the skin and brain. Thanks, okay. Joyce. Yeah. So next question is, um, what other type of the cells in the lesion um, have this mutation, except the endothelial cells, or yeah. what you guess? So that is a tremendous question, and I would love to know the answer to it. But it's clear that the mutation is, well, we, we see we have these triple negative cell population that have the mutant, there's mutant cells in there. Um, you know, maybe we didn't capture all the endothelial cells. I don't, uh, that's probably not the case. There's a, there's a recent paper from, um, uh, from Michigan where they looked at, they actually did a laser capture of, of um, the capillary malformation in the in the leptomeninges and then sort of adjacent cortex in the brain and they they it was very low but they found they could detect the mutant allele in you know in non cap outside of the the capillary malformation but adjacent to it so that clearly there are cells that um it, we just need to find that out i we don't know and and we have tr we have we don't get very many brain specimens, but the last couple we ha are trying to implement some more uh, markers so that we can deeply, more deeply sort out populations and and figure that out. But it's just, you know, it's way too early to say anything. So, but we, we're we're on it, and if we could get a brain specimen every week, we would make more progress. But you know, it's just we're only getting we've gotten six, I think, so far over three years. Okay, next question. All right, thanks, Chuck Joyce. So next question would be um, some questions here asking you, um, do you find any endothelial GPCR become abnormal in the CM or Sturgeon Weber? Since GRFQ always associate with the G couple receptor, G protein captor receptor. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I have to say we have not put any effort into figuring out what receptor is coupling to the mutant uh, G protein. It's just, um, you know, resources and time. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. So it's an important question. And I think, um, <clears throat> I think there are some, you know, 
labs work, hopefully working on that, but we, we haven't done anything. So sorry, can't say anything. All right. Thanks. So the last one from the question panel is, um, is GNAQ mutation found only in capillary malformation? Um, if so, why is it? Um, why is it not found in other uh, vascular anomalies? Yeah, I, that's um, you know, also a really great question. You know, other vascular anomalies have different mutations and then the, the vessels it, you know, there's venous malformations, arterial venous malformations, and 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 those are also somatic activating mutations. Um, well, venous there can be some inherited, but there are. It's just so why, you know, this particular mutation, always the same amino acid is causing these, you know, capillary malformations. I I, I don't, you know, I don't really. It's just if you get that mutation, you get a capillary malformation. So the um, yeah, we, we don't have, I don't have a good answer for that. Why it's just, except that that's what happens. Um, I guess you could say, um, uh, yeah, that's, it's really, this is it's just capillary malformations in the gene is really an understudied area. It'd be great, you know, they're, it's it's understudied so we have there are immense questions that are you know that all of you have have brought up um that we we want to answer um and you know people are working on developing animal models both mouse and zebrafish but it's just there's not like a you know there's only a handful of labs working on on this and the, i know the sturge weber foundation would be thrilled to have more people working on on it um and there are you know, I think they're fascinating questions and to figure out. All righty, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you both. I see that we're out of time. If you do have a question, please email info at navbo.org. We'll make sure to share your questions with Dr. Bischoff. Uh, have a great week. Thanks. Okay, thank you.